Welcome everybody. I'd like to get started. Um, I'm so glad that you could come today. And I would like to introduce uh, Shannon Rosenman. Uh, she is a, um, an occupational Shannon. registered and licensed. I'm going to put everybody on mute so that we can I'm getting paid through April, I think. Everybody on mute. Okay. And um, if you have any questions or thoughts, please write them in the chat while we go. Can you hear me, everybody? No, let's see. Let me get myself off of mute here. Okay. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So I'd like to introduce Shannon and Shannon is an experienced licensed occupational therapist. Can you not let me unmute you, Shan? Uh, it says I'm now muted. She's no, now you're not today. muted. We can all hear you. It's okay, great. Good. I okay. Um, and she works, with, uh, Shannon works with children and coaching and consulting with families and educators. And her experience includes work in the public schools, hospitals, and outpatient settings. And for the past 20 years, Shannon has worked in early intervention programs as a preschool consultant. And this included a position in inclusion, as an inclusion specialist for a group of early learning centers. And in that role, classroom teachers and center directors taught her about the routines and priorities of an early childhood classroom. And they collaborated so she could all guide them to adapt classrooms and teaching strategies to be equitable and responsible to all children. And now we're lucky enough to have Shannon here. I believe she works for Kencrest. I'm gonna turn the um, program over to her. She'll tell you a little bit more about her and then she's gonna share a great presentation with us. Thanks, Shannon. Hi everybody. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my um, my screen just because I, sh I start the PowerPoint to share. I, I'm manually moving the PowerPoint, but I don't know if I'll be able to see chat. <laughs> so um, I I see a whole bunch of people that are saying hi and that I know. So it's so wonderful to see you all and. I just have to tell you ahead of time, I've never done uh, anything like this on Zoom. I've used Zoom a lot, especially in the last couple of weeks. So you'll have to bear with me. Also, I have never taught having to sit still the entire time. I don't know how well I'll do. I merely may need a sensory intervention in the middle of all this, but <laughs> um, I'm going to try <laughs> because that's what we're all doing these days. So if people are saying hi to me and everything, because you know me, Hi, I'm sorry, I can't monitor chat and look at you and look at my presentation, but um, Ellen can get you in touch with me and I, you'll have my contact info. Okay, Ellen, I'm gonna try to go ahead and share my screen. No, Perfect. Now I am. And I have no idea what's gonna show up here. Desktop one, and then I'm going to do this, and then I'm gonna hit Woo. slideshow. Oh, I can still see you guys. That's great. Can you see it? Yes. We oh, see a screen that says, who am I? And all your information. I'm going to minimize this. Okay, so now I cannot see chat and I cannot see you folks just because- Okay, I'm so I'm going to try to see the chat from everybody. Okay, so Ellen, if you need to stop me, please yeah. say, say something. And we'll do. I have broken into this um, presentation. I have given out some spots where I'm going to come back into um, and look at chat. So as soon as I figure out how to do that. Okay. <laughs> so hi, everybody. My name is Shannon Rosenman, as Ellen uh, so nicely introduced me. And um, I'm here to talk with you today about how to talk to parents when things are a little bit iffy in the classroom with their child. And I'm just going to leave it at that for a moment, because I'll go and explain that more. So just some reminders, chat can be seen by everybody who is here today. And so if you have a comment about a child or an event in your classroom, you don't know who all else is here, please be mindful and be uh, careful to be confidential and don't include any identifying information. Good. So who am I? As Ellen introduced me, my name is Shannon Roseman. I'm an occupational therapist. I also provide preschool consultations to some schools in the area. 
Um, I started out many years ago as an occupational therapist, and then slowly I've gotten into the whole field of preschool consultation. I see many fellows folks out there, and I worked for about 10 years at um, Federation Early Learning Services for all of their um, centers to provide, I was called the inclusion specialist at the time, but to help out with what do you do with these kiddos who are, are really needing some extra help and direction. And really I was a consultant to the teachers. I was, I was not doing that as an occupational therapist. I was doing that as a consultant and I used my expertise and my background in OT. Um, I live in, I live nearby in Chalfond and um, I'm living in my home for many days now. So whoops, um, it really is uh, nice to be able to see people and talk to people and whoops. I hit a button and something went the wrong way. So if no, now I'm going to try this for the first time. Okay. So what I want to know is in the chat box, if you could quickly just say what age group you work with, whether you're the teacher or the center director or an administrator and name one or two behaviors or developmental delays that tend to get your attention the most. Okay. So I'm going to go look at chat. I think I see people. I see more people. Let's see how I can get to chat. How do I get to chat, Ellen? Do you know? Oh, I know. Stop share. Okay. Now I can see chat. We're cool. Yeah, there you go. Ah, wonderful. This is great. And I'm not a very fast reader on the screen, so I'm just going to. Oh, there's a range. Young toddlers, three, four year olds. What's SI, Natalie? Three to SI? Two and three year olds. Birth to three. Special instructor. Oh, SI, special SI. instructor. SI special got instructor. It, got it. Okay. <laughs> I'm slow. No, that's okay. When I get into my preschool headset, I, I tune out my early intervention headset. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, so what kinds of things do you see that kind of grab your eye? And obviously it's gonna be different depending on what classroom, you're, what age group you're with. Um, delays in language. Can you, you can hear me, right? Yes. yes. Um, great. Great. Language delays, a lot of language delay issues. I'm surprised I thought we would have more behavior delays or behavior struggles. Speech delays, language delays, great. Well, it's good to know because for yeah. future um, professional developments, we can focus yeah, on you, Oh, delays. and I know somebody who you should have. Great. You know Jessica Silverman? No, but I think oh. we can follow up. Oh, you have to. Okay. She's a fabulous speech therapist. Okay. Look for that after Passover. Yes. Everybody else having Seder by Zooms? Pretty much. Boy, hitting, pulling hair and biting. These are yes, really that, good I, shares. I was waiting for a biting one, you know? Mm -hmm. you have, there's always a biting. And impulse control, stubbornness. These are all things that... Hi, Lucy. Uh, great shares. Wonderful. Pulling hair? Oh. No pinching. Pinching's the worst. Oh. Okay. Ignoring. Oh, that's a good one. Stubbornness. Oh. <laughs> These are great. Okay. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to go back to share my screen. Keep your fingers crossed. Share screen. Desktop. Okay. Wait. Share and now wait. This needs to go full screen. Yes. Okay. Beautiful. Can everybody see it? Yep. Yeah. Just We're good. Two people should shake their heads so we know. That's all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Moving right along. Whoops. So, and obviously, if you have a question, you can write it in chat. As you see, I'm going to be checking chat hopefully more quickly. Also, when you do have a question, um, 
try to keep it really general. I can't do a private consultation here. I'm happy to touch base with you another time, but again, confidentiality and also just um, there's very little I can offer about a specific child or parent. So if you could make it general, that would be great. Oops, wrong thing. So today, this is the talk. And the talk is about um, talking to parents when you need to let them know that you're, you're really struggling with something with their child. And um, this training was about six hours long. I did it, Ellen Walters and I did it many years ago, and it, it went over three sessions with folks who were in, in her uh, classes. And um, now I've narrowed it down to one hour. So <laughs> please uh, know we may go very fast. Just so you know, I am very happy to come back and present on other parts of this in more detail. So just let Ellen know. So this presentation is about running a successful meeting with parents of a child who's really struggling in your classroom. Um, and that takes some thought and planning. But today we're gonna review how you might get this meeting to be successful. And these are the following steps, preparing for the meeting. That is a two and a half hour training that I'm going to put into about five slides, but I'll do my best. And then we're gonna talk about scheduling the meeting, actually running the meeting, and then how do you follow up and then how do you end the meeting, okay? So preparing for the meeting. Um, really, this goes without saying, you need to identify and describe the problem. And every center has some protocol or procedure that you follow, and you're going to do that. Either some people have supervisors, other people have um, uh, their center directors. I, well, you would always want to share with the center director, obviously, if they're, even if they're not your supervisor. Um, but it's really important to get a sense of what specifically is the problem here. So all of this is based on observation because that's what you do all day, you observe. So what is a good observation? It has to be objective and descriptive. And you also want to watch it over time. You're not going to run to your supervisor, your center director, because Johnny had a god awful day. We all have them. But um, it really needs to be objective. No, no language that's, that's diagnostic or, or too um, just kind of colloquial. You know, Johnny has just been crazy today. He's so hyper, he really needs some help. Is not really gonna be very instructive to anybody, including parents or to anybody who wants, who you're asking for some advice. But saying that, you know, Johnny can only sit at circle time for a minute or two, and then he runs around the room, he climbs on the furniture, he tries to run out the door. And those are things that you may have seen over different times in different days. So that's why what I mean when I say noted over time. And you want to describe when is this happening? Is it happening in every single activity or is it just circle time? Um, then the other thing you might want to include in your observation is what did you do to try? What did you try to do to make this work better? Um, so I tried to have him sit in my lap. He only sat in my lap for a minute and then he ran around. Um, I tried to let him hold a toy to play with. We tried before circle time to give him a walk so that he'd have a little bit of activity before we asked him to sit. So those are really important things to, to include in your observation. Strong observations that are documented carefully are probably one of the most important tools to having a successful outcome to your meeting. <clears throat> so observations. They need to be documented. Knowing them in your head isn't really going to help in the meeting. And they also, you know, when you're just keeping track of things, I don't care if you put tally marks and crayon on a piece of paper. However, you can't bring that into a meeting. And you can't share that with anybody other than your supervisor to just keep track or to keep track of your, just for your own um, presentation. So you really need to take all of your observations and put them into a hard copy or online, it, it really doesn't matter, um, so that you can give this information to the parent at the meeting. You want it to look professional. Um, you want them to be able to review it at a time when they're not feeling so stressed. Now this has to be in addition to any incident reports you might give out. 
almost always when there's a problem, although actually if the problem is just a language, you, you know, you're worried about a child not really speaking very clearly or not having enough words that they should be saying, um, that sort of thing, that wouldn't require incident reports. But behavior issues, the parents aren't gonna be taken by surprise because you're probably already dealing with it and being, making them aware. So two different kinds of observations happen and get, and get documented. Um, informal observations, that's you watching in the classroom. If you're wondering how long you can sit at circle time, you might spend a week every day and just put down two minutes, one minute, six minutes, 11 minutes, he fell asleep in your lap. Um, whatever it takes um, in informal observations, those are really important. You are trained professionals. You know how to observe in a way that's really different than how a parent would observe or how the doctor would observe or how Aunt Tilly would observe. So use your expertise. You, you're a professional. And like I said, it doesn't matter how you keep track, but put it into a professional format. The other kind of observations I call more formal observations. And that's when you're using a tool that's really designed to screen and, and organize your observations. The one that we mostly use, um, that I'm most familiar with is ages and stages. We'll talk about that in a minute. But this tool is designed to screen for development or behavior or emotional social, emotional social growth or interaction. So it's really important you keep notes. That should be no surprise to you. You've probably heard this just repeatedly. So formal observations. I'm really struggling not seeing people. Um, this is very weird. Formal observations are when you're using a tool. And as I said, I'm most familiar with the ages and stages. Um, counties, different counties require different things. If you're get, get, taking money from the county for pre-K counts, or if you accept um, kids on subsidy, or if you accept kids with special needs, as if you have any option about that, um, your counties are going to ask you to keep track of development. And most of the ones I'm familiar with use ages and stages, but there are other ones out there too that you can use. Formal tools have a manual that specifies what criteria must be met in order to complete the questionnaire and have the scores or the findings that you get be valid. These criteria are very specific. Look it up and follow them. Do you know that the ages and stages said you need to be familiar with the child, and they specify that, have spent six weeks or more with the child for at least, I wanna say 20 hours a week. I don't, they give a very specific number of how many hours a week you need to spend with the child and for how long before you can be considered a um, valid reporter and can complete this questionnaire. That's not saying you're not a professional, but if the kid only attends two hours a day and they only attend three days a week, you cannot complete this questionnaire validly. Go explain that to the county. Um, these tools are developed to be completed by parents too. As a matter of fact, that's how the ages and stages started. I can't get into this whole thing in more detail, but I would in another training on it. More importantly, these are not an evaluation tool. You are not evaluating this child. You are screening them. The score that you get, if you get a score, shows whether the child has a risk for a specific area of problems or whether or not they might benefit from a more in-depth evaluation. These tools are not designed to measure a child's progress. So you can't like use the ages and stages every six months and then say, oh, look, he got this score um, in September and now in January he got that score. So that means he's improving. That's not how these tools are designed. So some of these tools, it's interesting, the ages and stages is one of them, are not considered valid for use with a child who has already been diagnosed with a developmental delay. Again, you can discuss that with the county. Um, so, it, you know, I, the county just doesn't focus on that stuff and, it, and it's really a problem because it, it invalidates the scores you're getting. So just be aware of it. I, there are some, that, some fights I just can't take on, so I don't. Um, 
So, like I said, that was quick. That was all about observing and getting ready. So now you have to ask yourself, are you ready to have this meeting? Uh, is it really time to call the parents in for a meeting? That's different than having a quick phone chat or, or um, sending home an incident report or whatever. So are you ready? Here's the checks that I go through. Have you and your supervisor or the director um, agreed that, this, that you're ready? This is the right time to call in the parents, okay? Um, have your concerns been validated? This has to do with, if you're worried because Susie is only saying five words and, you're, you, and other kids in your class are saying, you know, 50, 60 words, is it developmentally appropriate for Susie to only be saying, you know, if you've got a class of wunderkinds, then you might have kids who are talking up a blue streak, but really at Susie's age, saying five or six words is not off the developmental scale at this point. So you really want to make sure that your concerns are validated by some, usually developmentally. Um, Behavior-wise, are they validated? It's safety. It, it almost always comes down to safety. It is not unusual for a very young child to bite. Not unusual at all. We all know it. I've had kids sitting in my lap at circle time and they bit the kid next to them. So <laughs> it's not about how vigilant you can be. It's the nature of biting. Um, however, when a three-year-old's biting, that's a big issue. So while I might really try all the tricks that you guys know quite well in dealing with kids, in dealing with, you know, a 16 month old who's biting, when a three year old is starting to bite or continues to bite at three, I don't wait so long for that sort of a thing. So your observations are now documented and clear and they're professionally looking, professional looking. Um, you and your supervisor have agreed on a goal for the meeting. The way I do that is we talk to each other and we say, We'll think this meeting is a success if this happens. Be that specific, okay? And here's the most important part. You feel like you have a well-rounded sense of this child, including their strengths, as well as their weaknesses. Their weaknesses are, are something that's usually something we're focused on anyway. But you also know this child's strengths. It's so important to assure parents that you really do know that their child is more than their struggles or their problems. It's really important. So consider how long have you observed for? And also consider what, what's the context of your observations. Did the child just arrive and they've only been in the class for two weeks? Has, um, has the school been closed down for the last six months because of the coronavirus? Um, is it over the holidays? Um, has the child been sick? Did a new baby arrive at home? Those are all things that, it doesn't mean you're not gonna observe, but you're certainly gonna include that in your observations. Are you confident that you saw this child's true self? That's what happens when you really see the child over time and you're not just seeing them during a difficult period. And have you documented what you've tried to do to help the child deal with this and succeed? That's a really important piece that's often left out of our observation documentation. So remember to try to do that. The other thing, before you're ready to really sit down and meet, have you thought about together, you and your whoever's gonna do the, the uh, meeting with you, have you considered what questions the parent might raise in the meetings? And do you have either adequate answers or the resources you're gonna need and they're gonna need to find those answers? Okay, that's a really important thing. So I don't regularly just hand to parents the early intervention brochure for the county, but you might want to have it nearby or that kind of a thing. But I, I wouldn't hand it out in the beginning. Um, so those are the kinds of things, you, and, and you want to talk back and forth about, well, they might want to understand this, they might want to understand that. That's what I mean by that. Chat review. <laughs> this is really weird. Okay, I'm going to hit stop share. Oh, I see the chat. Yay. Yay. Shannon, you're doing great. No Are worries. You? Okay. I, I realize I am somebody who really needs the feedback of the audience. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know if there's something you want me to do differently or talk slower or something. something people, have the, uh, if people have suggestions. You can put it in the chat box, but I see a couple thumbs up. Okay. I just don't really yeah. give a thumbs up. And, I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. Taylor, so Lisa, so I think you're doing I, you're you're doing really well, Shannon. Keep going. Thank you, Alan. I appreciate that. That's what we want. Uh, so, okay. So, so the the issues that you 
tend to find in your classroom are really can't sit at circle time and impulse control. Impulse control is a good one. Um, controlling their body, yeah. Um, spatial awareness, that's interesting. Um, listening, following directions, good ones. Attention deficits. Um, biting and hitting, yes, young toddlers. I could have guessed that, Genevieve. Uh, or is it Genevieve? I have two friends that are named Gen Genevieve, but one is called Genevieve, and even though they spell it the same way. Um, can't feed themselves, yes. That, oh, I'm gonna talk about that later. I have an example about that. Uh, if there's a pattern, then you can keep a running record. Right, Linda, I, I so agree with that. Um, it is hard to talk to a screen, Valerie. I just feel, you know, I practice these things like a day or so before I do it because I've done this before, but it, it's sort of weird to remind myself there's people there. Um, thanks, everybody. Okay. Any other questions? Glad it's interesting, Rachel. I'm going to go back to my screen. So I go over here. I share my screen. I do that. Hit share. And then this. Whoa, yeah. We're, yes. Moving right along. I'm going to get this yet. You can tell that I talk to myself. That's how I organize my... Uh... I think you've got it. Okay. So now we can get to the important part of today's presentation. Let's talk about the meeting. The first part is you have to schedule the meeting. I recommend that in most centers that the center director or the supervisor or somebody actually do the setup of the meeting. But if it happens that the director just doesn't have a, a working relationship, it could happen that they don't have a working relationship with the parents or, or caregivers, whoever you're inviting in, then, then the teacher and the director together could place the call. Always the teacher and the director could place the call. I just think the director needs to be in on this thinking ahead because if things really start to go south in the meeting, or if this problem is gonna, especially for kids who are having really significant problems, and you know, you're, you have enough training to know that you can pick those kids out. Um, you want the director there to support you. You don't wanna be alone with, with the parents in the meeting. So I really think that's critical. And it's important that the director be on the call. A lot of, par a lot of parents just don't feel all that connected to the director. And, and especially for larger schools, that's just fine. Um, but you want them there to make the call. So when you're making the call, please don't do it at pick up or drop off. That is not a time. Number one, confidentiality. But even asking them to pop into your office before they pick up their child, they've just left work. Well, none of this applies for now. But in the normal world, our old normal world, they just left work or they've just been dealing with something else. They, they may have to go to work. Um, they're, they're talking on their phone because no parent comes in without talking on a phone. Um, and it, it's just they're not prepared to to really give this the attention that it needs. Don't, it, and I think it kind of pulls the rug out for some parents. Also, use personal contacts, contact. Do not, you know, text the parent. Oh, uh, we need to make a meeting, Johnny's having a problem. Not gonna go over really well. I know that modern day young parents are used to this, but I'm old fashioned and I'm gonna stick with it. So I think you still really need to pick up the phone and call them. Now, I have parents that I see for early intervention who don't answer their phone. So I have a discussion with them when I start to work with them that if I call them, they are to answer the phone. Um, <laughs> so most parents are not like that at schools. Most parents, I mean, even if I'm having a, a session, early intervention session, and the parents have another kid who's in a daycare somewhere, and I'm seeing the kid at home, the parent watches their phone. So schools, they do tend to answer the phone, but not all the time, but please use the phone. Expl so you're gonna talk to them. You're gonna explain how in your center, you really find that it's best to work with parents when a child is struggling with something because they are the expert on what their child needs, okay? Um, I'm not gonna get into the, are they the expert or aren't they the expert? They have their own expertise about their child. And you're gonna let them know the purpose of the meeting, but don't scare them. Oh, for heaven's sakes, this is their perfect baby. Don't scare them. So you wanna say, I'm calling you to ask for your help. 
I really need some help figuring out how to help Alex when, when he is, uh, you know, on his own so much. It seems like he's really struggling to make friends at school and I want to help him and I need your ideas. Okay, own it. Say you need the help, not the kid. Even though ultimately Alex does need the, the help. But really, you're the teacher. What do you mean you don't know how to do this? So I'm not saying that for me, but that's how some parents think about it. So really own up to that you need their help. You're going to find they're a little less defensive if they realize that you have to, they need your expertise. Their expertise to combine with yours. Other things to consider. When you call them, parents will say, um, you know, okay, they'll talk to the child, especially for older kids, you know, and, and they know already that their kid, you know, has been hitting other kids or biting other kids, especially if it's a behavior thing, they've probably gotten incident reports, or you may totally blindside them because you realize that this two and a half year old is using less than 20 words. And you've really got to, you've tried everything you can to really facilitate their, their use of words. It's not ha getting anywhere. You wouldn't be sending incident reports home about it. You might be chatting with the parent about it. You set, definitely might be sending home little progress notes. It may be on their dailies, but this is a little different, you know? So you can let them know that um, it's great that they talk to the child. I don't know how that's gonna help some very young children, but you don't wanna deter them from that. But that's when you're gonna remind them, but you need some help. You need their help to figure out what to do at school. You could share that in your experience, it's always in a child's best interest to include parents when, when there's a situation. I said a situation like this, but you're gonna be more specific. Um, you're gonna remind them that the teacher only knows the child at school. That's the only way you know this kid. And even though you might babysit for them sometimes, or they might live down the street from you and you see them in the community, you really only know this kid at school. But parents have valuable information to help you so that you would know how to respond in the way that's best for their child. Remain positive and reassuring, but be realistic. I'm sh you can say, I'm sure when we sit down together and share what we all have seen, we'll be able to work out something together and, I'll figure, and we'll figure out what's the best way to help him at school, okay? You're only gonna for figure you're gonna help him at school. Do kids need help at home? Yes, but don't put that on the parent in the <laughs> at point in the middle. So other thoughts to consider. Find a mutually, well, now you're on the phone with the parents. So find a mutually agreeable time and no one should be rushed, okay? If possible, you want everybody in the room together. I don't know if we'll ever all be in a room together again, but <laughs> again, let's go back to regular times. It helps because you'll be able to see their face and their nonverbal kind of responses. And you can see if a parent is getting upset and getting teary. You can see if somebody is getting annoyed and angry and shifting in their chair a lot. It's also easier if they can see your body expression and your facial expression, that you're open to them, that you want to help them. It, it makes it easier. Allow a realistic amount of time. An hour seems just about as long as anybody can take it for. It might go shorter, but if it's going to be more than an hour, do a part two. Sometimes you might ask, this, this is a maybe. I actually, sometimes it works. Sometimes it might help to ask the parents if anybody else should, should join them. So if Nana spends 30 hours a week with the kid when they're not in school, she may be helpful or, or not. Um, leave it up to the parents, but don't invite a crowd. Really keep it to one or two other people. You don't need a crowd. <laughs> onto the meeting. And this is so important. I think this is really important. Prior to the meeting, copy all the paperwork you're gonna be reviewing. You'll have your own copies that you'll show during the meeting, but you should include any observation notes, not your crayon scribbles, but any formal notes or charts or narratives or questionnaires, even if you've already sent them home. Any resources, again, you're not gonna include the, the early intervention brochure, but if you know of something else that would be helpful. Um, any developmental timelines that might relate to what the problem is. So if, if um, Sammy is only using two or three words and he's two years old, a developmental timeline will show that, you know what? By two, a child should be saying 50 words. Let them see that on the timeline. Um, and put all that paperwork in a sealed envelope with the parents' names on it, because you're gonna give it to them early in the meeting. 
So now everybody's in the meeting, hooray. You're gonna thank everybody for making this meeting a priority, really very important. And from the start, say we have an hour and somebody is going to be the timekeeper, really. Um, let them know, let parents know that your center really values a teamwork approach with parents um, and that you're gonna acknowledge your limitations as an educator when it comes to understanding the child and you really need the parent's expertise and you really appreciate that. Express your appreciation for their willingness to come and work with you so that you can develop the best plan for the child. That's the goal of this meeting ultimately. Conceive that you understand how a meeting with teachers might be a little anxiety provoking. I always think it's better to just call it like it is. Your goal for the meeting is to help you as the teacher, okay? So that you now have a better picture, a more complete picture of what their child needs. And it's okay. Most parents are anxious. If you've had an experience with your kid, you can share that. It's, but it's better to just call it and, and name it. It's people take a breath when you appear. <coughs> now is the time to give them the envelope. Okay? Explain what's in there and let them know that you have to open it now, but you can give them to keep everything. I'm going to go check chat really quickly. Everybody Why? muted. Make sure that you're muted. I Why hear somebody. Do you think that chat. It's important to give this envelope of information to the parent now. I'm actually not going to check chat right now, but I'll go back next time I have a check in here. I just want to, in the name of time, too often. So, that you're going to get, you've really not even shared with them the specifics of the problem yet, but you're going to give them this envelope with all of your observations and information in there. You want to start the meeting by asking them how they feel their child's been doing in school. And that's going to be different if the kid just arrived a month ago than it would be if the child was in your, in your center since they were three months old. So you're going to choose your wording. And depending on how they answer, ask for examples, okay? I'm glad to hear that Allison really enjoys school. What have you seen that makes you feel that way? I can't get her out of the classroom when it's time for me to pick her up. Or, you know, she talks about school all the time. Or conversely, I'm really sorry to learn that you feel Harrison doesn't really like his classroom this year. Tell me more about that. And, and that is concerning to hear. And sometimes parent won't say anything to you. You know, they're holding on to it or whatever. That last line, tell me more about that. I tell teachers to write that down everywhere when you're meeting. It is the best line to open up to parents in a way that doesn't put them on the defense, okay? Tell me more about that is just the best thing I ever learned to use in a meeting. Um, and I share it with you that way. So now you're about to join the conversation. You've, you've kind of set the stage. You know how the parents feel about school and how they think their child feels about the school. So as you join the conversation, you're gonna join with their strengths. You are not gonna start out with, Susie bit another kid today. <laughs> it's, it's just not how you want the meeting to go. It's really important that the parents know that you know their whole child and that you don't just focus on their child's challenges. And devote adequate time to this part of the meeting. Don't just say, well, you know, Susie really does great with building blocks. She can build a block tower of about 10 blocks high. That's amazing. She's only about 15 months old. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, now, why are we meeting today? You really don't want to just, otherwise it sounds very insincere. Now it's good to also ask the parents, you know, what do they think their kid is good at? What are, where are their children's, where is their child's interest? Um, what do you think their, their skills are? What are you impressed by? What are you proud of of your child? Spend some time in the meeting doing this. By the way, strengths should be honest and genuine. Beautiful Olivia's smile and two-year-old Daniel's stylish clothing is not really a strength, just a luck of genetics or having fascist conscious parents. Don't give the kid the credit for it. Be genuine. And if you don't know what this kiddo is really good at, you're not ready for this meeting. You may need to spend special time just following the kid around and just seeing what they do. Some kids, the best thing they can do is line up their box 
and they can be really good at it and they remember the patterns and they do the same exact pattern every single time. Isn't that amazing? They have such a good memory and boy, they know everything there is to know about trucks. He can tell me the wheels. He can count the wheels. He tells me the name that this is a, a, a digger truck and this is a dump truck. Wow, I, he really likes trucks. Whatever you need to find, it needs to be genuine. A child is always more than their difficulties. It's really important to note that. And that's true. And if you don't think that, then you need to spend more time with the kid. Actually, I don't find that teachers have a big problem with this. That you guys are really, if I'm coming in as an in early invention and ask about the kid, I, I, I get what the struggles are, but you guys almost always just tell me, yeah, he's really good at this and he does this. And I'm just so pleased that that's what happens. Um, but tell the parents that too. So now you have to transition the meeting to get to the meat of the meeting. Um, and it really has, so every parents are anticipating it by now. They're getting maybe nervous or a little worried. You're getting nervous because you don't know how they're going to react. Help them transition. Do it gently by predicting it and saying, you know, um, now I want to talk about Alex's behavior on the playground. It's becoming a growing problem for us at school. Okay. And it, because you put it that way, You've let, and you've told them now it's time, now I want to talk about, they can take a breath and prepare themselves, you know? I mean, this is their perfect child and, and you're about to blow their world apart sometimes. So, you know, be mindful of that. Um, state the problem in a very simple way and don't use hyperbole. He is not the most hyperactive kid you've ever seen. And I don't care how much, how active the child is. Just use descriptive terms. Go back to your, and this is a time when it would be good to pull out your copy of what the behaviors are that you're concerned about. Share your observations. Let parents know that they have a copy of that in that envelope. And this is a time where I often say, oh, that, you know that envelope, where did you put? Oh yeah, there it is, it's in your purse, that's good, you know. And sometimes I also say, I'm so glad I gave it to you already because inevitably I forget to give this to the parents. So, and I do, which is what started sometimes why I give it to them early. Um, so that's when you're going to start to review your concerns. You're going to explain why were you concerned about this in the beginning? It's either developmental or it's safety. Say that. How did you determine that the child's behaviors or their lack of skill was something that needed your attention? Um, and again, that's behavior or safety. Or sometimes because of school, parents don't know what happens in school. And I'll give an example in a minute about it, but they, they just imagine it's the same at home. So they, that might be the other issue is, you know, it really makes it hard for us to get all the kids to sleep when your child falls and takes a half hour to fall asleep. Ask parents if they've observed these things at home, okay? Remind them that it, it would be very understandable if they see something very different and maybe never even see this. We all act differently in different settings. It's also not unusual for parents to, to kind of offer reasons or why the problem is, and they may even blame the teacher, okay? And they may disagree that, you know, this isn't a problem. This is how my other kids were. It's okay. Be prepared to let them know why you think the attention is required, your attention is required. Don't make this into a contentious discussion of who's right. You can use the tone of just let me share what I see, and then you can share what you see, okay? This has to be a mutual thing, and that's hard, especially when parents are getting more and more upset or defensive. It may help to let them know that you realize how sensitive this is, and you can reassure them that you're there to help them, but really it's you who needs the help because you would like to try some different things. If you want to know more, about why you feel that Michael's inability with, to eat with a spoon is such a problem, if they wanna know more about that, then you really need to be able to, in the meeting, say, well, you know, he's two and a half years old and he still expects me to feed him or eats with his fingers. And, and, and that's, you know, the other kids are all using spoons and soon he'll, they'll tease him. But the other so thing- Shannon, is, Shannon I just wanna, um, I just unmuted Zahava. Uh, Somebody had a question. Okay. And if you would uh, like to share it. Go ahead, Zahada. 
No, it's okay. I changed my mind. Okay. All right. I just Thank didn't you. To... Okay. Don't forget. You're welcome. Okay. Go ahead. Um, it may be that you learn something about family values. Okay. In this family, they may not even have tried to ask the child to use the utensil because they really like to feed their child. And I actually had that happen in early intervention kid once. Mom didn't want to stop feeding her child. It was the only interaction she had with him like that. And she wasn't willing to give it up. Um, so it's important to know that. Is it that the child just hasn't been asked to do this at home? If they're not concerned about the problems, ask them to tell you why they're not concerned. If appropriate, help them understand why at school it is something that you want to work on. Sleep routines being the uh, big one. You know, you can't, the fact that the parents let the kids scream themselves to sleep for a half hour, 45 minutes, may be fine at home, not in a classroom of 10, 12, 20 kids. So you need to inform the parent of that. If you completed a formal screaming, screening or screaming, I assume you already told the parents about it because you've sent notices home, they're used to it. You might, if you pull out the ages and stages to include that, when you include that, you might want to remind them. So this is the tool we use for all the children. And then you're going to ask, uh, you're going to help the parent understand how the information is being used, that you're using it to keep track of a how a child is growing and what they're learning and whether or not their needs are, are being met by how you're teaching in the classroom. By all means, tell them that this is not an evaluation of their child. Every time you show them that tool, you have to say that, okay? Um, and that the results, the results just help you know where to put your attention when you're working with each individual child in the classroom. You do this for every child, not just for theirs. Um, and you might, if you've included a blank form, I always include blank forms for um, ages and stages, you might say to the parents, you know, you could fill it out and look at it yourself, or maybe you can bring this to somebody in your family or friends who know it. I always tell them to, tell, to share this with the pediatrician. Um, remind parents that you only know their kid when they're at school and that the parent knows them very differently. It isn't like the parents observations and your observations are right or wrong, they go together to give you an entire picture. So this may be a good time in your meeting to stop and check in with how the parents are feeling. You've just given them the information, you've shared some paperwork, seeing this on paper is really hard. And it's usually good to acknowledge, again, how stressful it is to hear that their child is struggling, okay? Remind them that the meeting is so you can all work together to determine the best way to help their child succeed and feel happy and find success at school. So just try to kind of bring things back to, to the current world. I, I've had parents who are in utter tears by this point. You've got to address it, you know, um, but it's also good to put it in perspective. So I was going to go and check chat again, but I'm looking at the clock. Ellen, how close to two o'clock do we need to end? So we pretty much need to keep on board to just respect everybody's time. So we have 10 minutes. Okay. So I'm not going to check chat. Okay. I'll and I know there's minutes. so much information, but um, hopefully you'll keep coming back and we'll have additional ones. It looks like we're going to be hunkered in for a little bit longer. At, at oh, home. I think so. So what to do in the meeting when, when parents are getting really angry? or upset, that is just the way that some parents, they get defensive, they, they have to blame somebody, they feel to blame. Um, and, you know, they have different ways of showing it. I hear this kind of, kind of, we'll handle it at home and okay, let's go, that kind of thing. That's why I just hear parents as expressing that they're scared or they're embarrassed or they feel helpless. Um, they may blame the teacher, don't take the bait and it's so hard, don't get defensive back. Just remind them that you see, or just let them know, I, I see this is really upsetting for you. I know this is really, really hard. Don't even respond when they say, well, you should know what to do, you're the teacher. Parents sometimes just get really resistant to even acknowledging that what you're sharing is a problem. Or they may just see the problem very differently. Ask them for their suggestions. Ask them how they see the problem. And again, you really may need to explain why in a classroom, a behavior or a delay is a problem. And if it's appropriate, you might also help the parents see that into the future. 
how this issue might become more of a problem. You know, Johnny really is struggling with his fine motor skills and, and he can't really keep up with his friends and they're playing with blocks and he can't put the Legos together and he gets so frustrated and now he's throwing things. So, you know, usually parents kind of can relate to something like that. The most important part at this point in the meeting, especially if parents are upset and people are getting defensive, you cannot solve this problem in an hour. And solving the problem was not the goal of the meeting. You really got to remember that. So if the meeting's growing uncomfortable or emotional or even contentious, it's really best to acknowledge that and say uh, that, that I'm really sorry that you're so upset. Ask if there's anything you can do to help. Um, and, and that's really a helpful way to kind of diffuse what's going on. Remind them that the reason for the meeting is to help the teacher develop a plan. Um, and that you need their help and their ideas because they know what works for their child. Um, very often we, as well, I'm not a parent, but parents often um, will go ahead and do what their parents used to do because that's all they know. So they need some new ideas or they may get really, you know, um, outrageous about it and say, I I'm, I'm gonna talk to that kid, he's gonna be, I'm just gonna beat him, he'll listen next time, or I'm gonna throw away all his toys and that'll teach him to pay attention. Don't respond to it, you know, just know that it's just them. We're all here for the same reason, okay? Um, that you are gonna help them develop a plan, you'll do help them develop a plan for home if they need it, um, and that you're all here for the same reason, you all want what's best for Alex. So now you've got to move on to this plan, okay? And I ask, for, even if parents are really upset, just like we're moving on in this meeting, would it be okay if, or I would like to share a few things I want to try at school. Obviously, you've already thought of one or two things that you would like to try to do. Um, and you can let me know if you think we're on the right track. That's what you're going to open, that's how you're going to transition into this next step. Otherwise, you'll sit there and get into the whys of, I try not to get into why a child is doing something. You know, it's that, you know, Bubby always uh, spoils the child or, you know, it's somebody else's fault. Don't get into it. It's not worth it. And a, a good point was just raised is what if a parent still does not see the behaviors that you're concerned about? That's okay. You're seeing it. Okay. And, and, and that's a very good question. You can, and that's what I say, oh, well, that's okay. Well, at home, the child may not have those behaviors. Okay. You know, that's okay. Or it, it's different if they say, well, I know that Susie only uses four or five words, but Susie, who's the youngest of five girls in the house, um, really, she, parts, she plays with her sisters all the time and she talks all the time. Really, her four older sisters are talking for her. So, but it's okay. You don't want to get into a disagreement about it. You're seeing it at school and that's what you want to focus on. So, but at school, she's not really using words. So that's what I'd like to try to work on with her. Is that okay with you? Um, you're going to tell them the one or two things you're going to try. And then even parents who are upset are usually open to hearing your ideas. Ask the parents if they think your ideas may be helpful for them to try at home. If they say no, say, okay, is it okay if I try it at school? Okay. This meeting will really be disappointing if you just planned on making a plan, but don't make the plan. Make it. <laughs> so who will do what, how, and when? You're winding down the meeting now, but before anyone leaves, you must put together a specific plan for following up on what you're going to put into action. So at school, the teacher is going to we're going to work on the word more and we're going to teach, um, you know, Rebecca how to use her, her hands to sign for more. And we're going to do, and I'm also going to say more and I'm going to wait for her to try to say the word. At home, parents will do what? Now, some parents will say, we don't need to do anything. It's not a problem. You can say, okay, um, and end it. But parents might need some suggestions too. They may also may need some reassurance and direction if they just don't know what to say, what will work at home. You're just going to say, okay, there's no big issue about it. But now the meeting needs to end. It is, it's probably been emotional. There's little that adults can accomplish when we're overtired and upset and emotional. We're all stuck in our amygdalas and there's no more organizing that needs to go on. Um, let parents know it's time to wind up the meeting and how you're going to do that. Agree to a timeline to check in on progress. This isn't a follow-up meeting. It's just usually a phone call. 
Um, I always do it in two weeks, but if a problem is very serious, especially a safety issue, you may want to check in in a week. But you need enough time for whatever you're going to try and whatever the parents are going to try to, to have some effect. Um, and at the meeting, specify a check-in date. Who is going to call whom and what time? Write it in your calendar or on your whatever. Um, I still write in a calendar. And send a reminder home to parents. It's really important to do that. Now you've got to end the meeting, okay? Ask the parents, how are they feeling? You may be pleasantly surprised by this point. They may feel very relieved. Um, and, and they also may feel uh, reassured that you are, you're not blaming them. And, and there's nothing wrong with their kid. You're not diagnosing their kid. You just want to know how they feel. You want to let them know how to contact you. And here's why I say this. On occasion, I've been in situations where um, the parent wanted to talk to the director separate from the teacher. And so I always tell the director to make sure your card is in the um, packet that you're giving the parents, the envelope. Offer reassurance if parents are expressing or feel or seem upset. You know, this is going to be better. We're going to work on this. I'm really optimistic that you're going to see some nice changes. Thank parents again. Let them know how important it is that they came to the meeting and that they've agreed to help you. Okay. And the teacher can let them know that because they came today, you're going to be a better teacher for it, especially for their child. Okay. So now I am going to check chat. While I do check chat, I just want to say I want to thank you for attending today. I did it under two. Um, and if you want so to get impressive. Touch, if you want to get in touch with me about this presentation or anything else related to questions that you have, my contact information is available. I think the handouts that Ellen gave you, and also I'm going to post it in a second. Um, from my family to yours. And to you, we wish you well. And please be safe and careful. Um, this is just a time in our world that I don't even have words for. And as you can tell, I'm a pretty verbal person. And so please, please just take good care of yourself. And I want to thank Shannon. You were, this was brilliant. This was such an organized way of helping us express our observations and our uh, concerns to parents. And I hope that everybody can take a little bit of this along and empower yourself because it's a very, these talks are very difficult conversations to have. I just want to remind yes. everybody that tomorrow, Pam Woods is going to be on at 1 p.m. She's going to be talking about uh, positioning and transitioning in the classroom, body positions and what to look for. And on Thursday from 11.30 to 12.30, we're going to have this great, it's our very first early childhood education coffee and conversation, virtual coffee and conversation. Bring your coffee, bring your questions, bring your uh, observation, bring your heart, your oys and your joys, and we'll just chat for an hour and uh, see how we can support each other during these difficult times. That's so, so wonderful that you can do that because- Yeah, we are very lucky. Jewish Learning Venture, thanks you all for um, taking yeah. the time out of your busy day to learn and share all your uh, hearts and uh, observations and experiences with us. Oh, yes, my the pleasure. Your joys I love, live. That's I love really doing true. this for you guys. Shannon, you were terrific. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your compliments and just for joining in and being part of this. If there's anything specific that you want to just um, touch thank me, you so much. That, you can email me. Yes, great. OK. okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all. Be All right. well, Ellen. All right. You Thank too. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Everybody. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Thank you. Bye, Thank everybody. You. Bye. 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 Take care. You too. Thank you, Shannon. You're welcome. Sherry. Hi, Sherry. Yeah. Hi, Bernice. And there's Bernice. <laughs> Hi, Sherry. Sherry and I have been through many of these meetings. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> It's so you. nice to see everybody. It's nice to see everybody. It's coming back. It's so nice to see everybody. Uh, <laughs> have a good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to PT. Oh, <laughs> good luck. Where?